Has the Department of Conservation identified how many kōrora, little blue penguin, live in the rock wall at Pūtiki Bay? If so, how many? The Department of Conservation has advised me that there are currently no burrows with any sign of kōrora in the rock wall at Pūtiki Bay. We've got all of us going down there and there everywhere, you know, there's kōrora in the ocean, there's kōrora on the rocks, there's kōrora calling from their burrows in the rock wall. How can you say that you understand this population or this colony or any of the other life in this bay by coming over here and doing your, your monitoring or doing your observations on one random day a month. For me, Waiheke is a home away from home. Like I always know I can come back here. Um, and it's such a unique and special place within Aotearoa that uh, I guess that is why I am so determined to try and protect it. So this is a, a place for me that has been a sanctuary where my children have, have literally run barefoot um, and their playgrounds have been the beaches. So for me to know that one of our bays was pretty much handed over by the Auckland City Council to these developers who've been pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing to construct a marina on Waikiki Island. Um, my heart really sank. Though I think most of the community here was in disbelief. So what we have is we, we have um, a company called Kennedy Point Boat Harbour Limited who've got the resource consent from Auckland Council. They have investors who are investing money and they're putting it in a community where no one, very few people, want this marina to be built. Waiheke has been, you know, fighting having a marina on the island for about 10 years. So the first time uh, that I was, you know, aware of the, the amount of work that was being done with, by the community was definitely when they were fighting the the, the marina over at Mātiatia and um, successfully won in court um, in fighting that. And then straight after that, uh, Pūtiki Bay, Kenby Point was proposed for the next marina site. Protect Pūtiki started the, the first day that the Kaliope, which was one of the big barges, was brought in. And I was over at the Marae on the 9th of March last year and I could see the crane from the marae like even though it's quite a way quite a way over to Putiki I could I could see it and I was like oh I wonder what that crane is that's massive over in the bay and then um, the guy that was delivering soil to the Mata he was like oh they've they've brought the barge in to start the marina at um, at, at Putiki at Kennedy Point. I got a text from Bianca with a picture of the Calliope and she said it's about to start and I looked at the photograph of the first day of us down there and it's just one banner and three people sitting on a bench with Moria Timuana t-shirts and my resurrected uh, placard from the, K from the Matiatia uh, campaign which had Matitia crossed out and KP written there. And that was it. Tēnā koe, Scotty, o te rā e te iwi, tikara e te kōrero, rua te kaumāri mā ngā frihi mana i tai wawe mai ki te mautere o Waiheke i te rangi nei. Hei aha, hei kaupare i ngā take o te porotū, kwa tūki kone mō ngā marama e toru, anō te kōrero o toko toru ngā tangata i mauheretia. There was so much wrong of what was happening down there and I was just sitting and thinking, still, still. This is happening. People being um, roughed up um, by security people uh, using what they considered reasonable force. It affected me quite deeply because these were peaceful,
protesters and um, the level of violence. No one was doing anything about it. The police weren't doing anything about it. I had my daughter probably in the mo uh, granddaughter with me probably in the most violent times of that and so I couldn't take her down to the bay at all. So every day that we were going down there we were facing this this dynamic um, but we were so passionate and and so determined to stop the development that we just kept going back. The uh, uh, 32 at that time protectors were actually slapped with an injunction. It's an act of intimidation yeah. and not just for the 32, anyone who doesn't want this marina and I think for the community that was quite intimidating as well because you wanted to go down and support but you're like well where can I stand um, and so it, you know between between the injunction the security present and everything that has happened down at that bay it became quite a traumatic space to mm. be in. Going down for us is a deep wounding every time because having known that bay it's a place that is a, of great significance in, in Māori history, Māori cultural history, surrounded by par sites. It's where Te Arawa came in and relashed. Tainui Waka came in too. So in the year that we have now mandated that history has to be taught in schools, and if you look at the curriculum Māori histories up at the top, here we have Māori history being destroyed in front of our very eyes. Here we are down at Putiki Bay and I just want to show you guys like how big this marina is and how much of the bay it will really take up. Um, so here is where the floating car park is going to be. Sweep around the bay, you can see how far it extends, how far that marina will extend. So over there is um, what we call Zone B and that's where they've been using a method of pile driving called impact piling and pretty much they just use a massive amount of force to force piles into the sea floor um, and it is incredibly loud. So to see this be brought in to a, to a gulf which is already under pressure and put more pressure on a Taonga species that is already struggling, it's like there's no logic in it. We still come down to the breakwater at night to listen to the kōrera. They're very cute and they're very loud and they're very charismatic so watching them hop around the rocks is, is really fun. Um, and that's probably, you know, despite all this horrific stuff in the bay, you know, we can still come down and, and observe the kōrera and, and know that we're putting in the mahi to understand them at a deeper level than Doc have ever tried to understand um, and you know just for a few moments at night you get like this peace um, and this enjoyment of, of watching them. Before I was at Putiki or Ihumatau I felt really pessimistic about the state of the world and especially climate change I, called, I would have called myself a doomer and didn't think that anything was possible to change. Being a very quiet person, but getting to know so many people and to feel a part of this group has made me feel really hopeful. We're at a, a quite a pivotal time and for anyone who's investing in a business that is, is totally contradictory to um, like the climate crises right now, like putting a whole slab <laughs> of whatever it is on top of the ocean so cars can be parked there just does not make sense. So yeah, there's many layers, many, many reasons why I'm there. Um, I think the biggest one is the legacy for my children and descendants and also for all all of us in New Zealand, whether we're Tangata Whenua, whether you know, we've, we've come here from another culture um, or born, born here. So it's, it's time, it's time the perspective was shifted and it feels historical, it feels way bigger than Waiheke Islands.
what's happening, what's taking place. And anyone who goes down there and, and has spent time in the bay, they feel it too. I care about what's going on in the moana and I understand that it's not well and that there has to be a point where, you know, we see that things are legal but we know that they're not right. And this is definitely one of those cases. It's time that we see Auckland Council and our government stop putting money and the exploitation of resources ahead of the protection of our environment because that's what's got us into this mess. If, if people are willing to make some really brave decisions and, and, and shift what they see as power um, or management over our spaces and places, then there's definitely a chance that we can we can get things right.